Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the launch of our publication, Trim September 1920, here in the local library in Trim. Uh, my name is Jackie Maguire. I'm Chief Executive with Meath County Council. Um, and as you will appreciate, this is not how we would normally hold such events. And so it is a first for Meath County Council to have this virtual book launch here in Trim. Uh, and we're very glad that you are with us via your screens, in your homes, your offices, or wherever you may be viewing. Uh, I'm joined here this evening by our Cahirloc, Councillor David Gilroy, by the authors of the book, Councillor Noel French and Tom French, and by the, a writer and broadcaster, Miles Dungan. Um, and be assured that we are observing the current public health guidance, um, which is, has been very much to the forefront in our preparations for this event here this evening. Mead County Council is very proud to have supported the publication of the book, and it is one of the centrepieces of our Decade of Centenaries, Centenary programme for 2020. Unfortunately, um, as you are probably all aware and you can appreciate that we haven't been able to deliver the programme as we had planned due to circumstances beyond our control. But look, as they say, a book is a gift you can open again and again. And so it is with great pleasure that we are launching this fine publication here this evening. The period from 1912 to 1922 was one of the most eventful in Ireland's history. From the campaign for Home Rule through World War I and the Easter Rising of 1916 to the foundation of the Free State, this was a decade of great change. Campaigns for social ref reforms went hand in hand with political events and the Decade of Centenaries programme aims to commemorate the steps that Ireland took between 1912 and 1922 in a tolerant, inclusive and respectful way. I'm proud that Meath County Council and the local authority sector generally has played a central role thus far in ensuring the various commemorations have been success, successfully, I suppose, commemorated and have resonated with communities across the entire country. And this evening is just another part of that journey. I will be calling uh, on both Noel and Tom to tell us a little more about the book and the events it depicts and Miles will tell us more about 1920 and place the events in trim in a wider context. But first, I want to introduce the Cahirloch, uh, Councillor David Gilroy, who'd like to address you and say a few words. So David, can I ask you to come forward, please? Uh, thank you very much, Jackie, um, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here in the evening to launch the Trim September 1920 and I want to commend my colleague Councillor French and Tom French uh, from the Council Library Service for their work on the book and congratulate them on the high quality uh, and engaging, engaging presentation um, of the events that took place in this town almost 100 years ago to the day. As the Chief Executive has, has said, the publication forms part of the Council's Decade of Commemorations and we had planned significant programme program in remembrance and the, of the major events that took place in Meath 100 years ago, with the main focus being on the town of Trim for 2020. It was, already, it was originally also planned to mark, in July, the death of Seamus Cogan, the, of the 5th Oldcastle Battalion of the Irish Volunteers, the local elections of June 1920, uh, at our own AGM in June of this year, and this month's sacking of Trim. Uh, the formal events were to include, as appropriate, elements such as flag raising, wreath laying, and complementary cultural activities such as lectures and exhibitions. As with all previous commemorations during the decade of, of centenaries, the programme was to be led by the local, by locally by the local authority and delivered in partnership with relevant stakeholders. It was intended to address, uh, it was intended that the relatives of the deceased, the local communities and historical societies would all have an important role to play in these events. As we all know, the pandemic has struck our communities and our programmes, so they could not have proceeded as originally envisaged. But I hope that many of these stakeholders are with us now and have the opportunity to view this via this uh, medium this evening uh, and at some stage in the future. Uh, the Hindsight History Festival was promoted, was programmed for March 2020 and due to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the physical event was cancelled but elements of the event uh, were delivered online. The Hindsight Festival was programmed by our special guest this evening, Miles Dungan, as part of the highly successful uh, annual Hinterland Literature Festival in Kells. 
The Heinstein Festival includes, included three days of lectures on the War of Independence. A full day was dedicated to the War of Independence in Meath, and those lectures are now available online. And again, Meath County Council uh, are delighted to support the, the event uh, under the 2020 Decade of Centenary Programme. Uh, this book, uh, Trim September 1920, is a welcome addition to what has already been documented and I'm sure will be much appreciated by the people with an interest in our history, our county, and especially to the people of Trim and the surrounding areas. This book is really filling a gap on the shelves, as until now there had been an absence of a volume on the events in Trim, September 1920. Both Tom and Noel have gathered and hunted and unearthed everything that is known about the subject and have brought it together beautifully in a very visually, sorry, very visually in one place. They and the book are a shining light on a neglected aspect of our history. Um, I would encourage you uh, to read it and engage with the material uh, and I look forward to hearing from you uh, directly. Um, and in, in a moment you'll be hearing directly from, from, uh, from Tom, Noel and Miles uh, to say a little bit more about the book. Um, and just a personal reflection I, I suppose I have on the book myself just before uh, I hand over to them. Uh, while reading the foreword and, and setting the context uh, of the book, um, I noticed that uh, a fellow Athboy man, uh, Jimmy Finn, uh, was the man who was driving the uh, van over here on the Sunday morning, carrying the oils and necessary implements of the job to, to tackle the RIC barracks. The interesting thing about, uh, about Jimmy, obviously, the previous June, Jimmy had been elected to the Trim Rural District Council along with my own grandfather. So he was an elected representative, a councillor for the rural area of Trim. And subsequently, he also then went on to hold the same office as I hold as Cahirlock of Meath County Council. So such an action, I don't know what it says about councillors. Uh, and I don't know what it says about Cahirlocks. And I'm not entirely sure what it says about that boy men. But I'm delighted to be one of each. And I'm delighted to be here tonight to launch the book in the presence of the very talented people who, who have written it, uh, who, who have researched it, uh, and also to the executive who continue to support um, these fantastic explorations uh, of our history, our most local of histories, um, at a time when we're finding more and more out about ourselves, about our communities, and understanding, particularly at these times, the importance of being part of our communities and telling the stories of them. So, uh, without any further ado, uh, I'll hand you over to the next speaker. I think it's Noel, Councillor French. Or is it back to Jackie? Sorry, come on, uh, And thank you for your attention and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Thank you, Cahir. Look for that. Someone that you would have known, the connection to your own grandfather, the fact that you're now wearing the chain of office at the highest in the, in, in the county. It's, it's, you know, I'm not sure if it's coincidence or fate or all of that, but it's, it's, it's fantastic that we have publications like this to be able to remind the generation that we are now of all of that. So it's, it's, it's thank you for that. Um, so look, without further ado, I want to, I'm going to introduce both speakers and they'll come forward in, 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 in their one by one. I think Noel is going to address us first. Um, we were joking earlier, you know, Noel French, Tom French, I think I only this evening discovered that they are actually related. I think we're arguing whether it's fourth cousins or fifth cousins, but again, it's, it's, it's a great tribute to kind of history and, and you know, place and, and where we've all come from. So it's, it's really good that the, both of them have collaborated together to produce this fine document. Um, Noel has been a member of Mead County Council since 2014 and I think it's fair to say that he is very interested in local history, um, having researched and published more than 30 books and articles, Noel. Um, he graduated in NUI Maynooth with an MA in Local Studies and was director of the Meath Heritage Centre in Trim from 1987 to 20, 2016. Noel has published a number of local hist his histories relating to Meath and is a regular contributor to the local journal, Reacts in the Me. Tom French, Tom I've, I've known and as I have to at the outset say, an enormous asset to our library service. Um, he has edited and published numerous volumes on Meath history, including the reprinting of Oliver Coogan's Politics and War in Meath, 2013, A Bittering Cry, 2017 for the Ledwich Centenary, Old Castle Camp, 1914 to 1918, An Illustrated History, to commemorate the closure of the German internal camp in Old Castle. 
In media circles, we are familiar with the, with the refrain, talk to Joe, and in the local history circles here in Meath, the refrain is, talk to Tom. Anybody contemplating publishing a work on any aspect of local history will invariably find themselves at Tom French's door in the county library. He has guided, mentored and supported local communities to realise their ambitions of publishing local history publications in the most recent years. T Tom, I believe, is already researching his next book, The Battle of Curratown, which deals with one of the key events of the Civil War in Meath. So look, firstly, can I invite Noel forward and Tom will follow suit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, usual. Ta on ahas arum be on shot a nocht. Ocard on special ta agus ocard starul freshen. The most significant and most successful operation uh, of the Meath IRA in the War of Independence was the attack on Trim Barracks on the 26th of September 1920. The reprisals by the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries resulted in adverse publicity throughout the world to the sacking of Trim, facilitating support for the cause of Ireland's independence. Uh, the burning of Trim Barracks and the sack of Trim remain firmly embedded in the folk memory and the memories of the people of Trim huge amounts of connections and there would be a huge crowd here if we had it in actuality. I want to thank uh, you, to, I want to say thank you to Mead County Council for producing this book. It's a very appropriate remembrance of uh, this hugely significant and major event in Mead's history. It is just a gorgeous book. I can't describe it as anything other than that. It is, I think everybody in Trim should get it. I think it's 10 euros, going to be 10 euros, in, uh, and it'll be on sale here in the library and in Antonio's bookshop uh, in, in Trim. Um, I am so pleased to be associated with this, with this book, and I want to thank my friend and cousin Tom for inviting me to play a small part. It is Tom who put this book together. I merely put uh, the foreword together, which is an account of uh, the burning of Trim Barracks and uh, the sack of Trim, which followed. So this was a huge uh, event, major event uh, in uh, this town's history, major event in the uh, county's, county's history. Um, there's lots of different things I like about this book and, uh, and what Tom has done uh, with this book. It's an easy book to dip into and uh, dip out of. Uh, it has a huge amount of uh, prim primary sources uh, and uh, some wonderful, wonderful photographs. Of course, uh, the burning of Trim and the burning of the barracks uh, is perhaps the earliest surviving film uh, that we have for the town of Trim. And both events are commemorated uh, in Path A News. Work they do, both in the local studies section, I'm in and out of the local studies section, and I go into a different world when I go into that, that room for some reason. Uh, um, for over 30 years, it is a very special place to me. The libraries are a very special place to me as well. I miss them so much during the COVID shutdown. And I'm glad to say that I've been back here uh, in the library in Trim uh, and uh, borrowing books just this week. Uh, so it is, uh, we have an excellent library service uh, in, in Mead and they do much more than, than books and it, it covers a wide part of the community now. So I want to say well done to Tom for doing this. Well done to Mead County Council. Mead County Library uh, and everybody else involved with this. It is just a gorgeous book. I have to say that. It is. <laughs> Thank you, Gormagat. At various different stages over the years, I've been asked, is Noel my uncle? <laughs> is he my father? <laughs> is he my brother? So I'm delighted to get the opportunity to cheer that up. Anyway. 
what I was going to do was <laughs> um, give you an idea in just a couple of minutes of um, Mead County Council's contribution to um, publishing in the area of Mead history during the period 1913 to 1923. And where it starts really for us is the Trojan work done by Oliver Coogan, firstly in 1987 off his own bat, because as a pure historian and an inspiration to an awful lot of people, he realised he should go and talk to the men who were there at the time, which he did. And we were, it was a great pleasure for us and an honour to reproduce this book in 2013. And in the same year, we had a, a meeting in Trim Library with a visiting American scholar who was interested in the Black and Tans and memory. And he arranged to meet in, county, in library branches all over the country. But the evening that we had here was a very special evening recorded, but hopefully we will get a chance to do something similar in the not too distant future. Um, a book that doesn't seem like it's directly related is one called A Walk Along the Boyne by Anthony Bailey, which was a walk that Anthony Bailey, a New Yorker writer, took with Seamus Heaney back in the late 1970s. From, they started in Trim, Seamus Heaney bought a pair of boots in Max on the street just down here. They walked to Navan and then they walked on to Slane and then Seamus got the bus back into Dublin. But the interesting thing about that is that he's explaining the concept of the Boyne, not just as a river, but as what it all means, the cultural significance of the Boyne. And then in 2017, the necessity was to consider what Seamus Heaney calls our dead enigma, Francis Ledridge. And the purpose of this book was to try and bring together all of the best writing on Ledridge to give us some idea, 100 years after his death, what he means to us. And a kind of a companion volume to that was the proceedings of the seminar that took place in Slane Castle, the Ledridge Papers, which was a kind of an accidental book, but a useful one at the same time because it kind of brings him up to date and gives people in another 100 years an idea of what he was taught of 100 years after his death. And in collaboration with two historical societies, um, with Navan and District Historical Society, the, or the Mead men who went away to the war, and in particular, this is the work of Ethna Cantwell, who was interested in just focusing on the individuals and just putting the politics to one side. And it's one of those beautiful books where she restores the family stories to the individuals, which is a useful, a, a powerful piece of history and a beautiful book. And then the next one that we did in 2018, when the camp... The, the, we want to try and tell the story of civilian internment on the island of Ireland during 1914 to 1918. And this book kind of stands on the, on the, soldier, on the shoulders of scholars like Claire O'Neill, Connor Farnan, Sue Russell, Jerry Boylan, Ruth Fleischmann, Caroline Kane, and Car Carlo Gebler. And the purpose of it was not to let it slip out of memory, which it was in the process of doing. So for all of the technological advancements over the years, and I know I'm speaking to a practically empty room because of that technology, there is no substitute for what the book does. It continues to be cutting edge technology, which is why we do the work and are delighted to be supported in it. And it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Noel and Tom, thank you very much for that. Um, and I think, as, as Tom has demonstrated there, as we all approach on the cusp of winter, there's certainly, for all the local history enthusiasts out there and readers, there's ample reading material there that we can even, shall I dare say, mention that word, Christmas presents. Um, as I think we, we, we'll be all be shopping local and doing everything this year, so I, I think there's ample reading material there, so I think we've given us all very good, good, good direction of where to go, Tom. Um, so look, it's a, it's a great pleasure for me now to uh, introduce our very special guest here this evening, the renowned Miles Dongan, uh, writer, broadcaster and academic. Uh, he presents the History Show on Radio, RTE Radio 1 and is a weekly columnist on Drive Time, also on Radio 1. He's the author of a number of works on Irish and American history, 
including Irish Voices from the Great War, 1995, and Mr Parnell Rothweiler, 2013. He has taught at Trinity College Dublin, the University of California Berkeley and University College Dublin. He is currently an adjunct lecturer at UCD. He received a PhD from Trinity College Dublin in 2012 and was a Fulbright Scholar to the University of California Berkeley in 2007 and 2011. He is a director of the Hinterland Festival and Liter sorry, he is a director of the Hinterland Festival of Literature and Arts in Kells. So, ladies and gentlemen, and listeners and those present, can I ask you to please welcome Miles Dongan. Jackie, um, what I've been asked to do is to put what happened here a hundred years ago, on the 26th of September, in some local and national perspective. But, uh, first of all, can I congratulate yet again uh, the wonderful Tom French, um, fantastic editor who has been responsible for putting together some absolutely amazing books connected with, uh, to do with the history and the culture of, uh, of our county. Um, and to Meath County Council, represented by, uh, by Jackie. Oh, and also the cousin. No, we mustn't forget the cousin. <laughs> the contribution of the cousin, the forward, very important. And uh, also uh, to the person I reckon probably is the country's most unassuming and uh, understated but dynamic head librarian, and that's uh, Kieran Mangan on yet another beautifully produced uh, book. Um, Okay, in terms of context, in terms of what was going on elsewhere, obviously the, that, that week, that last week of September was of major significance when it came to the War of Independence because the sack of Trim was preceded by the sack of Balbriggan uh, and uh, there were deaths inherent in, uh, in, in that event. A couple of days beforehand, you had Rhineen in County Clare, where six members of the Black and Tans were killed by the IRA and where there was an overwhelming response, retaliatory uh, response from the, from the Crown forces and uh, civilians were killed locally. I will I'll come back to that. Um, it has to be said, and as somebody who is about to add to the volume of uh, printed material on the War of Independence in County Meath. I've got a book coming out uh, on the subject in May. It has to be acknowledged that Meath was uh, not a celebrated centre of IRA activity uh, during the Anglo-Irish War. Comparisons with places like Cork, Tipperary, uh, Limerick, Clare, Kerry are odious. And that's partly down uh, to the presence of, in the county, in Gormanston, training camp of dozens of readily available RIC black and tan recruits who were pressed into service in Balbriggan, for example, on the 20th of September, with horrendous consequences. Another reason for the relative lack of activity was, I think, the topography of the county. It lacks the mountains, the forests, into which an active service unit, a flying column, could easily melt after an attack. In addition, its proximity to Dublin was doubly inhibiting. RIC and military forces could respond quickly to uh, an IRA attack in Meath. And also, something that isn't uh, often uh, referred to, in the area around Dunboyne, which was the bailiwick of the Meath Brigade rest home for leading Dublin IRA figures who needed to get out of the city for any number of, uh, of reasons. Um, so, military fatalities during the War of Independence in Meath were quite low, depending on how you calculate them. They amounted to a combined Crown Forces IRA total of around half a dozen. There were actually more civilians, believe it or not, executed by the IRA, mostly as spies, than there were combined military fatalities on both sides. And uh, that's the story that I tell in the book that's coming out in, uh, in May. In September, 1920, the Meath Brigade uh, of the IRA, which also included Delvin in, in West Meath, comprised six battalions based around Dunboyne, Trim, Trim was the second battalion, Athboy, Kells, Oldcastle and Navan. Sean Boylan, uh, father of the great uh, football manager, 
an IRB member since 1915, a former Frongok inmate and a good friend of Michael Collins, was the brigade officer, officer commanding, the OC. Uh, Seamus Finn, Jimmy Finn of Af Boyth, to whom David has referred, was his second in command and he was the brigade adjutant. And Seamus O'Higgins of Trim was the brigade quartermaster. Now, the lack of activity, the relative lack of activity in Meath was clearly a source of concern for Sean Boylan in particular, and that might have contributed to his promise at a meeting uh, at, uh, in General Headquarters, the IRA General Headquarters in Dublin in August 1920, that the Meath IRA would take and destroy Trim Barracks, which was a well-defended former military barracks. And that meeting was attended by, among others, Dick Mulcahy, who was the IRA Chief of Staff, and uh, Michael Collins. When Boylan made that promise, Collins offered him an opportunity to change his mind, pointing out that the target would be dif very, very difficult to take. And uh, Boylan declined the invitation uh, to, uh, to withdraw that uh, promise, and even named a date. The, the third Sunday in September, that was later postponed by a week, so the attack actually took place on the 26th, Sunday the 26th of September. And according to the detailed account of the assault um, l left behind by, uh, by Seamus Finn in the Bureau of Military History witness statements, the IRA were fortunate in um, having a number of inside men. They, they got assistance from a man called TJ McGilligot, uh, who was an I RIC man who had quit the force shortly after the beginning of the Anglo-Irish War. One of many, over a thousand of them, had, uh, had actually quit for a variety of reasons. And McElligot had been based in Trim. He put them in touch with elements still within the uh, barracks who were sympathetic. And uh, the, actually the fact that one of those uh, sympathetic RIC man was to have been on duty on the 19th of September caused the postponement of the attack by a week. McGilligan also put them in touch with Constable Patrick Meehan of Trim RIC who had resigned from the force a very short time before the uh, IRA raid and who was very fortunate in the aftermath uh, to survive because his family's house was, uh, was raided because he was suspected of having uh, been uh, an, an inside man. Now that obviously assisted the plans for the, uh, of the assault. The purpose of the attack was for the Meath IRA to leave its mark on the Anglo-Irish War, on the conflict. Also, the purpose of the attack, obviously, was to capture a sizable supply of RIC weapons and ammunition. And as the book illustrates, the, the well-planned and well-coordinated operation under the 2nd Battalion Commandant uh, Michael Hines was a major success on both counts. There were no IRA casualties among the three dozen members of the attack force or the other IRA units involved in the capture of a number of mass going RIC men or the sabotage operations which also took place around the town making things difficult for the R any RIC force to be sent to relieve uh, Trim Barracks. Uh, Boylan himself was actually involved in the capture of the RIC men who opted to go to mass, eight o'clock mass uh, in Trim that morning. In terms of documentation of the barracks attack, the Meath Brigade Activity Reports in the Military Service Pensions Collection, which are beautifully reproduced uh, in the book, include plenty of information. They include the identity, for example, of the 36 men involved in the actual attack on the barracks. And uh, as you'd expect, in this neck of the woods, the list includes a plethora of Giles's, Lawler's, and O'Hagan's. Um, and uh, who are members of the, of the 2nd B Battalion. Um, as I said, uh, Seamus Finn has left the most comprehensive account of the attack, the man who provided the petrol and the paraffin, who brought it uh, to Trim and then who took away the weapons afterwards in the same van that he had, uh, that he had driven in on. Um, and um, the, the, I think the, 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 the sweetest line in, his, in a very long witness statement, which is not just devoted to the attack on, uh, on Trim Barracks, but the sweetest line is, our plans worked like magic. Ironically, the only words of praise that Finn has for any of the RIC men uh, involved, any of the RIC men who were captured, is for the only casualty who was the head constable, Constable White, uh, the only uh, RIC man who actually put up uh, any, any resistance. 
Uh, White was paid, by the way, compensation of £6,500 the following year, um, which was a sizable amount of money in those days uh, for his injury. The IRA were very chivalrous, mind you. They actually drove... Um, uh, they drove Head Constable White to the doctor in order for him to be treated uh, for his wounds. You, that wouldn't have happened in Cork or Kerry, I don't think. So I think the Meath IRA were much more, much more chivalrous. Interestingly, I think some, something of the order of, of £100,000 in overall compensation, the ratepayers of Meath had to fork it out. That's just for your benefit, uh, Jackie, not something you'd be particularly happy to hear. And uh, the problem was that um, uh, that half of that went to uh, the Crown for damage to the, uh, the barracks. It wasn't just the, the aftermath uh, that, was, that was compensated. Um, like Bloody Sunday in Dublin, uh, two months after the events in, in Trim, it was a game of two halves, or to be precise and I suppose mathematically ignorant, a game of three halves. The violent aftermath led the, the historian of the Meath War of Independence, Oliver Coogan, who's... Uh, uh, whose book you uh, uh, beautifully reproduced in, in 2013, to refer to the barracks raid as a Pyrrhic victory, uh, because the IRA success of the morning was followed by two sets of Crown Force reprisals in the afternoon, in one of which they shot up a hurling match on the fair green and injured two of the, uh, the young men involved, uh, uh, wounded two of the young men involved. Uh, then there was clerical intervention. The priests, local priests, appealed to them and uh, everything calmed down and they withdrew, only to come back at three o'clock in the morning when most of the uh, damage was actually uh, done. Um, there's still some controversy about the identity of the pre-dawn raiders in uh, Trim. Seamus Finn says in his witness statements that they were tans from Gormanston, from the training camp in uh, Gormanston. Sean Boylan refers to them as auxiliaries, as auxies from Beggar's Bush Barracks. Um, but there's another uh, possibility uh, because the father of local IRA volunteer Paddy Lawler, who advised him, don't come back and sleep in the house tonight, and he went and he slept uh, somewhere else in the, in the house of, I think, it was somebody called McGrew or McGraw, I can't remember uh, exactly. But Paddy Lawler's father. Um, that house on Castle Street, just down the road from here, was raided, was looted, was destroyed. The family was subjected to uh, humiliation. And Paddy Lauder's father insisted that there wasn't an English accent amongst the uh, perpetrators of that particular atrocity, that they were all Irish. And Lauder's father was convinced that they were actually RIC, uh, RIC men from Dublin. Subsequently, Lauder joined the Garda Shia Corner and met a man in the depot in Phoenix Park who told him that on the night of the 26th, 27th of September that he had personally opened the gates to release a number of lorries filled with RIC men bound for Trim. So you can choose for yourselves. Was Trim sacked uh, uh, by the Black and Tans and the Ogsies or was it sacked by, uh, by God-fearing Irishmen? Who knows? Um, you pay your money, you take your, takes your choice. Some of the consequences of the events of the 26th of September in Trim, I think, are very, very interesting. One of these was that despite the relative quiescence of the county when it came to uh, military activity, that Meath, and specifically Trim, were singularly honoured, I have to say, by the placing of an actual auxiliary unit based in the industrial school of the town. That was a, an act of faith on the part of the Crown forces uh, in uh, the bulchiness of County Meath and the bulchiness of Trim in particular. You got your own auxiliaries. Well done. Not everybody did. Um, the subsequent raid uh, on the premises of the Chandler family in Robinstown by Ogsy elements stationed in Trim led directly to the resignation of the commanding officer of the auxiliaries. Uh, a very interesting man called General Percy Crozier, uh, somebody that I've written about myself in the context of the, of the First World War, um, but uh, acting on information 
from uh, something that I wouldn't even have thought was possible but did actually exist, an auxiliary whistleblower. Um, he suspended a number of those who were responsible for the assaults on the Chandler uh, family and for the looting and other damage that was caused in Robinstown. And when they were reinstated by the RIC Inspector General, Sir Hugh Tudor, Crozier decided, I've had enough, and uh, he uh, resigned. He wasn't particularly impressed uh, with the force that he was uh, in command of. Um, of, of, of overarching significance, something I referred to at the beginning, Trim comes in the same week as Balbriggan and Rhineen in County Clare. Overwhelming Crown Force responses against civilians for IRA actions, which made it abundantly clear that the British were operating a tacit policy of reprisal, no matter what they said. Um, and um, interestingly, I suppose from a personal point of view for Sean Boylan, in the aftermath of the Trim Raid, Boylan was informed by a priest of his acquaintance that the Crown Forces, uh, that he had been informed that the Crown Forces were going to retaliate by burning the Boylan home in Dunboyne. And in his witness statement, uh, Boylan says, I asked him to have the RIC and the Black and Tans informed that if my house or any other volunteer's house in the brigade area was burned down, I would have every British loyalist house in County Meath burned as a reprisal. The enemy apparently took heed of the warning and did not burn down my house. Believe me, from what I have read of and studied of Sean Boylan, he bloody meant it, and uh, if anybody had touched his house, he would have gone through uh, and carried out the threat. Um, in conclusion, even after Trim, there were still concerns at GHQ level about the lack of activity in uh, in County Meath. In December 1920, for example, senior Meath IRA figures met with uh, Ginger O'Connell, who was the IRA Deputy Chief of Staff, in the old workhouse in Delvin. And according to Boylan, at that meeting, Major General O'Connell, explaining the purpose of the meeting, stressed the necessity for the immediate consideration and preparation of plans for attacks on enemy patrols and barracks in the brigade area so as to relieve pressure by enemy forces in Cork and elsewhere, and that was key as far as Mulcahy, um, um, O'Connell and uh, Collins uh, were concerned. As much activity elsewhere in the country to take the pressure off uh, Munster, because Munster in particular, Cork in particular, were feeling the pinch. Despite, though, this relative lack of aggressive actions, in early 1921, when the IRA was reorganized and the first Eastern Division was formed, incorporating all of Meath, a lot of West Meath, uh, parts of Louth and parts of Kildare, uh, and I think even stretching down as far as Offaly, Mulcahy and O'Connell still had enough confidence in Sean Boylan to put him in command of this much larger unit. I think had he not promised a successful raid on Trim Barracks in September 1920, and had he not subsequently delivered on that promise, obviously with the help of people like Seamus Finn and uh, Hines and people like that. One wonders whether he would have been entrusted with uh, that command. Thank you very much. Miles, thank you very much for that extremely interesting insight as around all of the events uh, almost 100 years ago. I think it, it's the lilt of your voice uh, Miles, that we all, well, I certainly love listening to, um, and it's such an interesting and humorous way that you tell it, uh, extremely interesting, and um, I suppose I'm a bit shocked that the poor old ratepayers of me that I didn't know that had to pay up money. Uh, we might need to go looking for back for next year, but anyway, and I suppose I can still confirm to you, being a native of Trim, that the people of Trim are still very bolchy 100 years later. And, ri and rightly so, and rightly so. <laughs> Happy to say that. Well, sure, we, we might try it. We might try it and spend it here in the library. Okay. <laughs> so, look, that brings us to the, to the conclusion of our evening. It just remains for me to thank in particular all of you for, for viewing the event here this evening. Um, I want to thank our speakers, our Cahirlach, Councillor David Gilroy, to Noel French, to Tom French, Tom in particular for all the work he's put into the book, and in, partic in particular our very special guest, Miles Duncan, this evening. Um, but I do want to thank um, 
our, my own staff here in, in the Trim Library for, for all the work they've pulled together. And particularly, Miles has mentioned him already, uh, Kieran Mangan. Uh, he's our county librarian, but he's also coordinator of the Centenaries programme, and he does a, a fantastic job. And, and we, we're, we're again, we're very lucky and very blessed to have him uh, in the Mead Library service. Um, and again, just to mention, you know, the book, it is on sale, no one mentioned it, for a, a, a very reasonable amount of €10. Euro. Uh, it's on sale here in the library, but it's also on sale in the local bookstore Antonio's here in Trim, who I believe do take uh, online sales. And I think you can get that at antoniosbookstore.com. So make sure you check that out. So I suppose... Finally, just to say, we are working on our 2021 programme, as 1921 saw a number of events and activities of, of significance, including, I think you mentioned it, you, you referred to it, Miles, yourself, the looting of, by auxiliaries of the licensed premises and stores in Robinstown on f February 9th, the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in London on December the 6th by a delegation that included Eamon Duggan, who has, has his roots here in Longwood, um, and the vote of the Mead County Council on December the 30th by 15 votes to four, urging the Dáil to ratify the treaty. So we hope to be in a position that we are commemorating uh, all of these with you in a more conventional manner next year. And look, we, we will be issuing details of those in the coming months. So for now, again, thank you so much for taking the time to view us online. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, and above all, Stay safe. Thank you.